Daily Chat with City Magazine. I'm Kylie Harmon, General Manager of City Magazine, and today we are visiting with Matt Shannon. Say hello to the camera. Hello. Hello. Uh, you are the Assistant Executive Director for the Fort Lincoln Foundation, correct? Yes. Wonderful. You know, now I've had you on the show in the past, but for those people who maybe didn't see the show and really don't know what you guys are, what is the Fort Lincoln Foundation? Well, the Fort Abraham Lincoln Foundation, uh, we're a local nonprofit, um, started back in 1982, and the first charter was to rebuild the Custer House at Fort Abraham Lincoln. And from there, it sprouted into all other areas, um, reconstructing other buildings at Fort Abraham Lincoln, the barracks, the granary, the commissary, um, starting a um, uh, uh, the best interpretive uh, program in the region um, with both living history and third person interpretation um, and develop the uh, tours that people see today. So the Custer House is actually the house that General Custer yes. lived in. Yep, yep. The, the fort was occupied back in the 1870s and uh, General Custer lived there for a few years before, before leaving Fort Abraham Lincoln and heading to the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. Okay. Um, so we portray the year of 1875 out there and so we have an exact replica of the house that he lived in, um, in during that year and um, we take uh, people back in time and kind of give them a tour in uh, what we call first person interpretation which is a soldier or a laundress taking the, the guests back in time and, and giving the tour from the point of view of a soldier or laundress um, in the 1870s. Oh wow, so it's actually like basically a mini place. Yeah. In the different yeah. areas of the fort. Yeah, essentially, yeah. It's 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 it, just the same lines as what like Colonial Williamsburg does, um, Plymouth Plantation, um, a very strict living history um, type of approach to the tour of the Custer House. Um, there are artifacts in there and um, and other items that um, make the house look as if it has been lived in, and, and it is 1875, and we have uh, neat ways of pointing those things out to people and not having to break character um, of the time period. So it's always a fun um, um, time to, to take a tour if you haven't done it out there and, and go back in time and kind of see what life was like um, on the Dakota Prairie um, in the 1870s. Um, then they can take um, a view of the barracks, which is um, one side of the barracks is set up as if it would have um, been occupied by the men. Okay. Um, so it's got all the, the bunks, all the foot lockers, the mess hall set up, things like that, so people can actually see what a, a barracks um, at Fort Abraham Lincoln would have looked like. The north side of the barracks has um, biographies of men that um, rode with General Custer to the Battle of Little Bighorn. So you kind of get a little bit of both um, out there. Hmm. And then um, in the late 90s, we pushed our efforts over to the north side of the park with the Honest Lantern Village and began raising money and uh, reconstructed six earth lodges out there and started a um, tour program as well. We don't do first person living history, we do third person, so you actually have a guide that explains the history of the Mandan culture because it's a little bit harder to do first person interpretation. So like, when, when did the tours run at Fort Abraham? All summer long. Uh, we start in the first part of May and run all the way through the end of September. Tours run uh, from nine to five uh, daily, every half hour. Uh, oh, so, so every half hour every you half can hour, start yeah. on a new tour. Yep. Yep, and it's not affected by the flood at all, so uh, you can definitely come out and, and see all that uh, Fort Lincoln has to offer. So now you talked about the Mandan village, is it, wait, this land village. Yep, the yeah. Honest Land village, it's um, uh, an ancient, I shouldn't say ancient, but an old Mandan village site um, dating back to the 15 and 1600s. Um, it was abandoned uh, prior to Lewis and Clark's expedition even um, in 1804 coming up the Missouri River. So they um, um, they had already moved north um, in the Washburn area, and that's where eventually the story would Lewis and Clark would meet up with the Mandans and spend the winter of um, 1804 with them. Oh, and that was actually up in the Washburn area. Up in the Washburn area. Okay. So this these this village here dates prior to um, that occupation. It's okay. what we call the Heart River phase of the um, Mandan occupation of this area. The Honest Land Village was one of uh, several villages in the area. Um, they uh, believe anywhere from seven to nine different villages and a very large population. Some um, historians believe there could have been close to 15,000 um, wow. Mandan people living on about a 10 mile stretch of the Missouri River in different oh. villages along there. So qu a quite large tribe um, for the time period. Now how far is that from Fort Abraham? 
Uh, from from Fort Abraham Lincoln, it's only about a quarter mile uh, oh, okay. up the road in the park. But oh, they so were, it's in the park, and so you yeah, can't get it through it. Okay. Yeah, it's in the park in Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park. It's um, it's separated by a hundred years of time, basically, and uh -huh. so that's kind of the the confusing part. A lot of questions go, well, was Custer here when the Mandans were here? We're like, no, no, there was about a hundred year gap between when the villages were abandoned okay. and when the military, um, the frontier military showed up in the So 1870s. I wonder what that had been like for when they actually showed up and do you think they discovered? Um, there were probably remnants of the village there. Um, I don't know if they would have known exactly what it was, but it probably would have, the grounds where the village is today um, would have looked much of like what it is today um, besides the areas that we've reconstructed. A lot of um, depressions in the ground probably would have been some um, a garbage left over that had decayed over the year. There might have been some remnants of the gardens and things like that um, that they would have had. I don't know if they would have had much to do with that. Uh, when Lewis and Clark came through 20 years after the village was abandoned um, in 1804, they did record in their journals that there must have been a village here at some point because oh, there okay. were remnants at that point. Um, whether or not they lasted as long to the 1870s, um, no one would really know. So, um, how did it become found out that this was actually the Mandan people's village? Uh, just through archaeologists. Um, the, one of the um, key factors was in Lewis and Clark re on their return trip in 1806 um, came back with a Mandan chief. His name was Sheheke. Okay. And um, they came back and when they camped on the east side of the river on their return journey back to St. Louis, Sheheke told the, uh, the Corps of Discovery that he had been born in this village across the river. And that's uh, speculated that that is on a slant village where he would have been born. Um, so that's kind of where we can get that it was a Mandan. But also through just archaeology, you know, each tribe had their different types of pottery, different types of um, mm -hmm. artwork and, and tools. And so you can kind of, through that type of um, deciphering, we can figure out that these were Mandan, um, Mandan people, that, people that lived here. Yeah, because there's quite a bit of information out there that has been discovered over the years all the way back to the early 1900s when okay. um, archaeologists were out you know, trying to learn about these groups and things like that. So now you guys are open Monday through Sunday? or yep, seven days a week. From eight, eight, what, nine seven? to five. Nine to five, okay. Yep. Okay. Wow, that, that's just so interesting. I mean, that's so much more than I did. Well, there's even so know. much history there's there. There's so much history. Yeah, and, that, and that's really the, the whole mission behind the Fort Abraham Lincoln Foundation is to preserve the history at Fort Lincoln State Park and continue to interpret it to the public. Um, we see, you know, anywhere from 15 to maybe 20,000 visitors that come out to the park to take tours. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of them, you know, 25% are probably from the local area, but a, a greater percentage are from the outside area out of the state of North Dakota um, coming through that want to learn more about Custer. Custer's usually the big um, clencher there, you know, that, that he stayed there. And it was only there for a, a, a small period of time, but... Custer in himself is, is, is his own culture. Um, okay. So he's one of the most photographed um, historic figures. Um, wow. He's probably one of the most written about historic figures. So he um, really brings a, a character to Fort Abraham Lincoln, which if he wouldn't have stayed there, probably wouldn't had, um, we wouldn't have been able to build what we have done over the years. Okay. So now you guys also operate the riverboat. Yes. Yeah. And Obviously, that has been affected by the flood. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Oh. Not the boat portion, just the... The, the boat's still floating yeah. just a lot higher than what it has yeah. been. Yeah, you know, it, over the last um, 10 years, you know, the Fort Lincoln Foundation has taken uh, more of a role in tourism in the Bismarck Mandan area. And, you know, development of the tours at Fort Lincoln was the start. Um, we then started to operate uh, what we call Five Nations Arts, which, which is downtown Mandan. It's a native art store. So um, we have um, that shop. And then more retail establishments at Fort Lincoln. We put in a coffee shop. Because there's a lot of these services that people are looking for as they're traveling. And we want people to stay longer in one place mm -hmm. and um, obviously spend more money. But, you know, kind of slow down and, and take in these sites. The opportunity came to us in 08 of buying the riverboat. Um, at first, it wasn't really a, uh, an avenue that we wanted to go down. But um, talking with other individuals in the area, um, the North Dakota Tourism, the Bismarck Mandan CBB, you know, 
the the concern was that we might lose the boat, and the, mm -hmm. and the riverboat really is a, a, a huge aspect of, of Bismarck and Mandan, a huge attraction. Cause well, I even remember as a little girl when I came to visit my aunt and uncle, I always remember the riverboat. Yeah, and, it, and I remember the riverboat going over the bridges when I was little and seeing it up and down the river, you know, cruising, uh, stuff like that. So, it, and, it, and it showcases one of the best uh, uh, characteristics of Bismarck Manor, which is the river, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, a gorgeous, free-flowing stretch of the Missouri River, which is um, kind of unheard of in these days. Mm -hmm. But um, also, as we can tell, is a quite a volatile as well, you know, what we're experiencing. But, you know, it, the first few years of the riverboat were just phenomenal. Uh, it, we took it on. We, we, we brought our customer service that we do at Fort Lincoln to the riverboat, um, expanded our cruises. Uh, we do 20 weddings on the boat. I, I never thought I'd be a wedding planner, but <laughs> got into that realm. How was uh, that with the brides? No, I know how to work with them now. At good. first it was a little scary, but I got off to a good start. But, you know, in coming into this year, into 2011, we were really hopeful for a really good year. And like everyone, the flood kind of took us by surprise um, as it kind of um, started to rise and continue to rise. And, and really no one knew exactly what was the the final outcome and that's kind of why it affected us the greatest so where is the boat right now the boat is uh, located in the Mortz Marina it's tied up um, in there and it will remain there through the rest of the, the winter until 2012 we officially announced um, last week that, um, that we weren't going to run in 2011 we were, we were trying to be more optimistic and Hopefully the water would go down. Hopefully we'd get the boat out and um, start cruising again and maybe, you know, secure some of the summer. But uh, the forecast from the dam and the, the tentative um, damages that have occurred, um, we don't know exactly what, but it was uh, too unsure. You know, we just didn't know what to expect, and so we didn't want to take that risk of, of investing more money into the boat and then not being able to secure that. Your guys' whole office area and where the boat actually usually yeah. lands is completely yeah, we, we, gone. Yeah, we were one of the first ones to experience. You know, the Port of Bismarck, where, where we dock, our concrete slab, as I call it, um, where our docks <laughs> tied to, um, is probably one of the lowest parts of Bismarck. I mean, it floods every spring. We get water over, which is a normal thing. And just about the first week in May is when the water first went over that concrete slab. And it wasn't even deemed a flood then, but we were already dealing with that high water and trying to prepare and we did some uh, invested in some um, more dock uh, more bridge type apparatus to span the the distance of the concrete slab so we can go from the bridge onto the dock but the water continued to rise and that was the hard part and so it kind of finally went over that finally um, took our dock to a point where it was been unsafe to tie the boat up to it just because of the pressure and you know You have 60 ton of metal tied up to it. So you need to make sure it's secure Yeah, yeah, I think I think the passengers would definitely want to make sure it's secure as well Well, okay on a more happy note because you guys have been affected with I mean With the flooding and not being able to operate the riverboat. I mean that's had it take a huge hit into your operating Oh, expenses. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, the riverboat was essentially, you know, the riverboat we took it on because it was a it would be another uh, leg of funding for the Fort Lincoln Foundation and um, it's always great to have more legs because if mm -hmm. you lose one then you still have some to keep you afloat and um, the boat essentially takes you know a, a large a sum of money to start up in the spring you know to get it uh, do all the maintenance that needs to be done from the winter hire our staff train our staff you know, buy the inventory get our bar selection put mm -hmm. together and all that kind of stuff and so you know it, it does take an, a large chunk of change and, and it, the cancellation or us quitting the riverboat came at the most inconvenient moment right around Memorial Day weekend when our season starts mm -hmm. and that's when we had to